Welcome to Conversations with B'nai B'rith International. I'm CEO Dan Mariashin. Thank you for spending some time with us today. Greece's Romanio Jews are among the oldest and least known of all the Jewish communities in the diaspora. Rich in culture and tradition, the Romaniotes have persevered in Greece for more than 2,300 years. But now, the largely unknown community is nearing extinction. With me to shine a light on their unique history and influence are Dr. Samuel Gruber and Renee Pappas. Sam is a researcher, author, curator, and consultant, and is the founder and managing director of Gruber Heritage Global, GHG, a cultural resources consulting firm. He's a recognized expert in many of the aspects of art and architectural history and the historic preservation of Jewish cultural sites. Sam has taught courses in art history and Jewish studies part-time at Syracuse University since 1994 and is also visiting associate professor of Jewish studies at Cornell University. Rene Pappas is an international art expert and an authority on Greek culture. In 1997, Rene served as the general director of the Festival of Ancient Olympia, which has since led her to assist Greek cultural institutions promote Greek art and culture. Since then, Pappas was the Director of Development for the National Hellenic Museum in Chicago for almost two years, among other key roles. And in 2018, she joined the New York-based artist management company, Redwood Entertainment. Most important to our discussion, Renee is the executive producer for the documentary, Before the Flame Goes Out, which tells the story of the Romanio Jewish communities of New York City and Greece. In our conversation, Sam and Renee will delve into Romaniote history and explore the ethnic Jewish community that once thrived in the northwestern Greek city of Yanina. They'll speak about an exhibition titled Romaniote Memories, a Jewish journey from Yanina, Greece to Manhattan, photographs by Vincent Giordano that was previously hosted at the Embassy of Greece in Washington, DC and the Consulate of Greece in New York City. Sam, Renee, Thank you both for being with us. Good morning. Nice to be with you. Good morning, and it's good to see you again, Dan, after many years. After many years, it is good <laughs> to see you, Dan, and to meet, and to meet Renee. So tell us about Romaniote memories. Who was Vincent Giordano, and how did he get involved with the Kahila Kadoshi Yanana community? Well, I'll, I'll start with that one. Um, in your introduction, you, you did not mention that uh, I am the head of a very small but useful not-for-profit organization called the International Survey of Jewish Monuments, and the ISDM plays a role in this, so uh, I want to uh, alert you. Uh, Vincent Giordano was a New York photographer, uh, as his name suggests, Italian-American, not, uh, not Jewish or Greek. And uh, he was fascinated uh, with his home city and uh, was a celebrated, a very accomplished photographer in New York and of New York scenes. He also did uh, commercial work as well. And back in uh, 1999, he was strolling on the Lower East Side of New York on Broom Street, and he happened to pass this little synagogue. At that time, there were still a few of these old sort of tenement synagogues, immigrant community synagogues in the neighborhood. And um, uh, he was invited in, there were people there. And this was the KKJ synagogue, Kahila Kadosha Yanina, the Romagnot uh, synagogue founded by immigrants to New York in the early 1900s and built in 1927. And they showed him around and they made him very welcome. And he became fascinated uh, with what he saw and fell in love with this group of people and the community. And this began a decade long project of photographic documentation that grew to include also audio, video, and went far beyond the walls of the synagogue to embrace uh, activities of the community, uh, social activities, and eventually took him on several trips to Greece as well. Um, the next year, as this project began to grow, he needed a, 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 a fiscal sponsor, an umbrella group, and he also needed some academic, some scholarly uh, um, assistance to, to understand what he was doing. 
and he turned to ISJM. And so uh, we took on that role and we brought together a group of very prominent scholars in, in Greek and Sephardi and Jewish affairs to oversee the work. And, um, but it really, it was Vincent's project from the get-go and he, 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 he drove it with a passion and, um, and that's where we got, uh, got to. Sadly, uh, despite several successes and a big exhibition in New York in 2008, he, he died of cancer in 2010, almost exactly 10 years ago today. And his work then languished. And it wasn't until my, uh, well, I didn't know Renee at the time, but it wasn't until my good friend now, Renee Pappas, approached me a few years ago and she had met Vincent in Greece and said, we've got to do something about this work. We have to make it known again. Um, that 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 the work has come out of storage, and we're 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 working to uh, to bring it to the public. Yeah, Renee, what was it about this idea that attracted you to this particular um, uh, program of having this exhibition? Um, there's also a documentary film here. Tell us about how how you got involved. Uh, well, I moved to Greece in uh, 1990, and soon after that, I met Sam Ben Ruby, who was the uh, original uh, president of the board of the Jewish Museum of Greece, and I met Ma Nikos Stavoulakis, who was the director. And so I was aware, I was made aware of the museum, of the uh, Romagnat Jewish community in Greece, which before I moved there, I knew nothing about. And then much later in 2009, I attended a, a concert that was organized by the Fulbright Foundation of Greece. And that is where I met Vincent and his wife, Hilda. And uh, I was, he, we talked, uh, I, we got together while they were in Athens. And I said, this is so wonderful. If I can do anything to help, please let me know. Uh, we kept in correspondence until, of course, he became ill. And then uh, in 2013, I moved back to the United States, reconnected with Hilda, who connected me with Sam. And uh, we joined forces. And I have, when I lived in Greece, I was involved in a number of you know, cultural uh, projects. I worked with any number of museums, including the Benaiki Museum and the Boulandris Museum. And also I was an advisor to the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs in Greece. So I, I was able to connect with a lot of people, including a number of uh, people in the Greek government, especially in the diplomatic corps. And then again, with a number of Greek American philanthropists. So my job has been so far to connect with the Greek American community. We've had support for the two uh, exhibitions that we had at the embassy and at the consulate in New York from the AHEPA, which you know very well because you, you all work together. And, uh, and a number of individuals uh, have supported those exhibitions. And of course, we're looking for the support of other individuals and institutions um, in both the Jewish and the Greek American communities to um, continue with what we're doing. Well, I'd like to come back to the uh, documentary before the flame goes out in a little while, but first <clears throat> tell us about the, the definition here. Who are the Romanio Jews and where do they fit in Greek and Jewish history and geography? Because we often talk about the Greek Jewish community uh, but now we have to look at, at a subgroup, in effect. Uh, tell us about exactly who they are. All right, well, definitions are, are, are slippery, uh, difficult uh, uh, things to get a hold of. Um, when we speak about Greek and Greek culture, um, on the one hand, we think of a wide-ranging uh, culture that goes back uh, thousands of years, and in comp that encompass not just the the the... the Peninsula that is modern day Greece, but uh, covered much of the Eastern Mediterranean and even, uh, you know, infiltrated uh, and, 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 and uh, much of Italy, uh, where there were Greek colonies and Greek cities. And even during the Roman period, the, the, the language of the educated intellectuals uh, was, was Greek. Um, 
we know that ancient Jews spoke Greek and we have Greek inscriptions in the ancient synagogues of uh, Eretz Yisrael. And of course the, the, uh, the Torah was translated into Greek in, in Egypt. Uh, so, so Greek was the, the English of the day. It was the language that everyone spoke. Um, more recently, the history of Greece has been somewhat tortured, particularly in the 19th and 20th century, because most of Greece from the, from the 15th century on was controlled by the Ottoman Empire. And it was only in, 18, in the 1820s that the Greek War of Independence created a new uh, Greek uh, Christian uh, nation in, in the southern part of what is modern Greece. But the rest of what we know as modern Greece was still under Ottoman control well into the early uh, 20th century. So to know what is Greek and what is Ottoman, what is Roman, what is Jewish is sometimes sometimes difficult. But if we think of it linguistically, uh, the Greek, Greek speaking Jews do go back to antiquity and to biblical times. And we know that physically Jews have been on the territory of modern day Greece since at least uh, Hellenistic times, and uh, they were widespread in Roman times. And we know that they uh, continued throughout the Byzantine Empire and then through the Ottoman period. We divide this into two main uh, periods. The, the period before, and this we have to go across Europe, the expulsion of the Jews from Spain in 1492, and the period afterward. So, before 1492, all of the Jews in modern day Greece and throughout this area were culturally unified and linguistically unified. And we call, these are the Romaniot Greeks who go back to ancient Rome. Uh, the Greeks actually called themselves Romans. So they go back to ancient Rome. But um, after 1492, the Ottoman Empire welcomed in uh, tens of thousands of Spanish speaking or Ladino speaking Jews from Spain and these then settled uh, throughout the empire. And this is the origins of the Sephardi diaspora. And the Sephardi Jews were numerous and they also were politically uh, and economically uh, powerful in the Ottoman Empire. And in many places they quickly um, uh, subsumed, uh, they, they overwhelmed the, the, the older Romaniot communities and um, became the dominant Jewish culture. Today, when you meet Greek Jews, there's a good chance they are Sephardi Jews with origins in Spain. But there continued to be this older strain who didn't speak Ladino, but spoke a, a Greek Jewish dialect, Judeo-Greek. Um, and they continued their old uh, religious practices, liturgies, prayers, etc. The stronghold of this culture was in Northeastern uh, Greece, in Epiros, and uh, Yanina, uh, certainly by the 15th century, 16th century, became a stronghold of this Greek Jewish community and uh, actually became somewhat insular. They resisted the settlement of Jews from other places. And it's in large part because of that, that the culture remained uh, intact uh, up until the 20th century, until uh, the Holocaust, really, when, when almost all of the Jews of Yanina were killed by the, uh, by the Germans. Right, I know there is a, a small community in Yanina today. Uh, I had the opportunity to, to meet uh, with their leadership some years back. Um, uh, are there still Romanio Jews in Greece today? There are, but not many. Um, before, uh, you know, around 1900, I think there were about 3,000 Jews in, in uh, Yanina, which was then under Turkish uh, rule. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't unite with, with, uh, with Greece until after the Second Balkan War, or the First Balkan War of uh, 1913. And um, uh, before the Holocaust, there were about 2,000 Jews in Yanina, uh, I think 1,950, we actually have an exact count. Uh, almost all of these were deported uh, to Auschwitz and only a few survived. Uh, today, there are about uh, a few dozen Jews at most in Yanina. It's hard to say because many of them have homes also in Athens, they come back and forth. And then we have a, a Romagnot, a Yanina uh, diaspora uh, in other parts of the world, but the, the largest uh, organized community uh, is still in New York out of Kiela Kadosha Yanina. Many of them live in Long Island or Westchester, but they still, they still see the Lower East Side Synagogue as their cultural and spiritual home. Uh, outside, of, uh, outside of New York City, um, where else are there Romagnot Jewish communities? Oh, well, um, put it this way, there are, 
there are uh, Greek Jewish communities uh, throughout the world. Wherever there's been a Jewish diaspora, there are Greek Jews, Australia, uh, uh, South America, uh, New York, the West Coast. Uh, there are Romagnots, I think in my experience, and, and I'm, I'm not the expert on this, in, in New York, there's some in Los Angeles. Um, there's a large Greek community in Seattle, but it's mostly Sephardi. Uh, there's also been a lot of intermarriage between the Romagnot and the Sephardi Jews who are now just all collectively Greek. And of course, there's been a lot of intermarriage uh, overall between Romagnot and Sephardi and Ashkenazi Jews. So it's, so it's hard, to, hard to, to, to specify. The museum at Kahila Kadosha Yanina, which is run by our great friend, Marsha Haddad Economopoulos, uh, tries to keep track of all these people and they, they put out a newsletter which reaches people uh, not just in New York but all over the world. Um, and at this point, pretty much anyone who 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 can claim some lineage, uh, Romagnol or Greek lineage, is welcomed into this larger larger family. When did they uh, come to America? Were they part of of that immigration at the beginning of the 20th century that, that came uh, from Europe, from many different places in Europe? And, and why did they choose New York? Well, for the same reasons other immigrants did. Um, there was a lot of political turmoil and economic um, displacement in the late 19th and early 20th century, but 19, 1905 was a big year of emigration from Yanina and uh, about 1500 Jews uh, left. Uh, they didn't only come to, uh, to New York, they went to places within the Ottoman Empire, they went to Constantinople, they went to Alexandria in Egypt, uh, they went to wherever there were Greek Jewish or Jewish communities, uh, but where their Greek language would allow them to, to succeed. But many came to New York. This was you know, the Golden Medina, not just for Ashkenazi Jews, but for, for people from all over the world. And uh, they settled in the Lower East Side, um, just like all these other Jews, but they didn't speak Yiddish. So they were somewhat isolated and they founded this little synagogue. Um, it was 1906, I think was the year they, 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 they they, uh, they founded their society, 1914, they incorporated, and it wasn't until 1925 to 27 that they had the funds to actually build this small, this small shul. Um, well, shul, they wouldn't have said it was a shul, a synagogue, a small synagogue. I'm, I'm showing my Ashkenazi roots here. Um, and uh, the, uh, there were about 500 congregations or synagogues uh, on the Lower East Side at the turn of the 20th century. So this was just one. And there were something like 400,000 uh, uh, Jews, uh, immigrant Jews at the, the peak of immigration between 1880 and 1925 on the Lower East Side. And, and of course, this is a very tiny, tiny community. The fact that it survived at all when so many other uh, congregations and communities have dispersed or merged or you know, moved on um, is, is quite amazing. And it speaks to the cultural, um, the, the, the really uh, strong cultural identity of, these, of, of, of this community. Also the leadership of a couple individuals who against great odds persevered. Uh, the, the community uh, flourished in New York between about 1927 and World War II. And then it went into a steady decline in the 50s and 60s, um, like most other Lower East Side synagogues, people moved to the suburbs. Uh, but this one guy, Hai Gani, uh, really, really sustained the congregation. He led services every week. So the synagogue never closed. It's always been active. And even today, you can go there every week for services. It's still an active uh, synagogue, as well as being a small museum of Romagnot history. Uh, just uh, one, one more uh, question about uh, the Lower East Side and, and that community. Uh, what did they do? What, what, where did they work? Were they... M most Shop of, owners were they workers? What what were, was the situation of the of the community in terms of uh, their day to day? Yeah, most of the Romagnot Jews settled around Allen Street. So if you know the Lower East Side, they were along Allen Street between sort of Canal and Delancey. Um, My grandfather lived there briefly. Okay, yeah. yeah. But most of the Romagnot Jews that I know of in the first wave. Um, were artisans. They were embroiderers. They were tinsmiths. So they brought a lot of the traditional crafts that they practiced in Greece, and they were able to make a living. They were not wealthy by any means. These were these were uh, you know small, uh, family-run, uh, operated uh, businesses, services. Some of them did open stores, not too many. 
Um, and their life really did revolve around the synagogue and then the social institutions uh, that were created. There was a burial society and then there was a sisterhood and there were other groups through the 1920s and 30s that formed and, th and th this maintained, maintained the culture. Interestingly, in order to sustain the Greek culture uh, in, in the next generations uh, so that the children would keep speaking Greek uh, Greek Jews were spent, sent to the same schools as, as the Greek Orthodox Jews. So, so there was this uh, Greek Christian synthesis. It was more important to be Greek uh, than, than to be uh, uh, Christian or Jewish. The Greek culture was dominant. And that's one of the reasons why it's been so easy to forge partnerships today. The, the collection of Vincent's work has been donated uh, to Queens College where they have the Hellenic American Project which emphasizes the Greek American experience. It's not the Greek Jewish or the Greek Christian, it's the Greek American uh, experience. And uh, this now forms an important part and of, of both for visual and for, for uh, audio uh, hi history. Um, and the experiences of Greek Jews and Greek Christians outside of the a house of worship uh, is often quite similar. They eat the same foods, they like the same music, uh, and the fact that they all spoke Greek united them away in a way uh, because they they were not part of the the German speaking or the Yiddish speaking or the Italian speaking or the Ukrainian speaking or the Polish speaking communities. They were they were Greeks, and that's really really important. It was important a hundred years ago, and it's still important today. There's one more question about the synagogue. So it's on Broom Street, but the, as you say, Jews have moved on. They moved to other places, but. Uh, those Jews in the New York area, those Romanio Jews, are still coming back to that synagogue, correct? They, they come from, from all over the metropolitan area. Yes, they do. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's an Orthodox shul still, and it follows the traditional uh, Romaniot liturgy, although it's been altered. It has had uh, Sephardi and even Israeli influences, depending on who's attending. But the, 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 the service is led with a traditional... Uh, Romagnot uh, pronunciation and, and chanting, and it's been passed down from one leader to the next. Um, and uh, it is, uh, so it's Orthodox, but if you, it's, it's, it's like many Orthodox shuls in older parts of cities that continue to operate today. Uh, it's a don't ask, don't tell type of Orthodoxy. Uh, once you show up at the door, nobody asks how you got there. Um, and uh, they, you know, Shabbat is celebrated there. All the holidays are there. I was there for Purim last year. I've been there for Simchas Torah. I've been there for many, many uh, festivals and it's just a joyous uh, place to be. The fact that the congregation is small hardly matters because the space is so tiny. So even if you have 40 people in there, it seems pretty crowded. Yeah, I want to say something interesting about the uh, synagogue. There's also a small museum within the synagogue that has some beautiful photographs and wonderful artifacts from the communities, both in the United States and of course, that were brought from Greece. But also every May, unfortunately it didn't happen this year, uh, on uh, a weekend in May, they have a Greek Jewish yeah, festival. Cool. So they close off that whole block of Broom Street and they have music and of course, food. Um, and so the food that you get at that festival is going to be domadas, it's going to be spanakopita, it's going to be all the foods that their grandmothers made. And um, as, as Sam has pointed out, the food is, is different. It's very different. But also there's a marvel, I want to suggest there's a marvelous cookbook uh, written by Nikos Stavroulakis on uh, Greek Jewish recipes. First of all, it's the recipes are great. I've given it to a dozen people as uh, wed wedding gifts and so forth, and um, just wanted to point it out. And that cookbook has both Sephardic and Romagnot recipes, and it's beautifully illustrated. So I just want to give a plug for that book, which you can buy at the synagogue. Yeah. Renee, let me ask you, you're, uh, you're the executive producer of Before the Flame Goes Out, which tells the story. You know, I think that with the, uh, the uh, relationship now but, uh, amongst Greek, uh, Greece, 
Cyprus and Israel um, in the Jewish community and in the, the Hellenic community here in the United States as well, uh, there has been kind of a renewed interest uh, in all things uh, Greek Jewish and all things Greek, um, trying to, to find uh, those uh, ties that bind. Tell us about the documentary. Well, uh, Vincent began as a, a photographing the synagogue, as, as Sam said, in New York, and then ultimately in Yanina. Then he began uh, doing interviews and also uh, shooting different ceremonies at the different, both in Yanina and New York and also the after party, if we want to talk about it, after some of the ceremonies and so forth. And that came together to be a documentary. Um, Vincent was in the midst of editing when he passed away. So all of those videos are now at Queens College. In there, there, there is an edited version that we're going to be working on to develop into a film. But then there are the individual uh, interviews, which can go up to 20 minutes, even a half hour, which once everything gets uh, digitized and put into the uh, website and the archives at Queens College, will ultimately be available for especially scholars to see. So not only will there be a documentary at some point, uh, but all of the parts of it will be available for people to see. As you were talking about the ties between Greece and Israel, what we happily encountered is we got an enormous support from the Greek embassy in Washington, uh, therefore the Greek Ministry of Foreign Affairs. They're very interested in once we all open up in having exhibitions, physical exhibitions at other consulates in the United States. Um, as you probably know, Yanina has a Jewish mayor, Dr. Elasi. Um, this is the first, this, uh, it, he is the first Jewish mayor elected in Greece. This is a wonderful uh, situation. And he has also uh, requested that an exhibition uh, that he would like to present an exhibition at the Municipal Gallery. Uh, and we hope that um, there will be uh, physical exhibitions of the photographs um, at Jewish cultural organizations in the United States. We hope it can go to Israel because part of the project, um, and Sam can talk more about the logistics of it, is to create high resolution versions of the photographs so that they can then be sent to that entity and then they can print them so that we don't have to you know print ship and so forth um so we think that this is um given all of the ties as you talked about between greece cyprus and israel um that this would be a marvelous cultural exchange on both ends well, I think there would be tremendous interest. I mean, I grew up in a small city in New Hampshire, and uh, there was a small Greek community and a small Jewish community. Uh, our synagogue was only a few blocks away from the St. George's Greek Orthodox Church. Uh, we went to school together. Um, the, our, our shop was on the, you know, near uh, Greek-owned stores in, in town. And there is a lot of, uh, I think there will be a lot of interest, and there's been a lot of contact uh, between Greeks and Jews and cities around the country. So I would think that this would be a real natural uh, for uh, programs all over the United States. Um, Sam, let me ask you, as uh, just to conclude here, uh, what's in store for Giordano's uh, multimedia archive uh, at Queens College? Um, what do you, I mean, uh, Renee has just talked about some of the things that are happening. Uh, what do you see as the future here? For this uh, this cache of, of, of very important photographs uh, about this uh, a largely unknown community. Yeah. So let me um, let me say something about the photographs and uh, reiterate what Renee said that while we would like to see the um, uh, a remake an expansion update of the of the documentary that 
uh, Vincent had left as a rough cut in 2008, to, 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 make, it, to make it viable today requires a, a lot of, of, re, of rethinking and also reconfiguring. Uh, and so we are, uh, in the process of that, we're really focusing on the original material, on the photographs, the, the audio recordings, the videos and like, uh, as the constituent parts. And that's the partnership we have with Queens College where Hilda Giordano donated uh, all of this material uh, last year, about a year and a half ago. And uh, the first task is just to, to catalog, to organize everything because we have um, many, many images. We have the physical uh, negatives, we have prints, we have uh, cassette tapes, we have mini cassettes, but we also have lots of scans, fortunately that, that Vincent did uh, onto already to digital while he was still alive. And um, COVID of course has slowed this process. We thought we were going to be doing all of that this year uh, in preparation for a big show, uh, three or four times the size of the embassy show uh, at Queens College, maybe in, in 2021, but, but that's clearly on hold. So we're going to an entirely uh, online exhibition that we hope, that we expect will, will be live sometime in November, in a few weeks. Uh, and that will have at least a hundred photos with some explanatory essays and other materials. Um, and that's the first, the first step. But that is supposed to give a taste to what the entire online presence of the archive will be eventually at Queens College where, where all of the material will be accessible. Um, so not just a few photos from each role, but you can actually look at each role of, each role of film that was shot and see not just three images of people dancing at the Pasha if you want, but you can see 50 or, or, or 200. Um, you don't have to see just one or two images of the terrific architecture of the 1829 synagogue uh, in Yanina. Uh, we have full documentation of that synagogue. Uh, we have uh, images of uh, the, the New York synagogue, of the Judaica. We have images of a bar mitzvah that took place there. We have uh, images of the cemetery in Yanina. There are many, many different things, more that can be in any one exhibition. So that will all be accessible online. Maybe we'll have a book coming out of it, or at least a catalog. We'd certainly like to see that uh, in some way or form. There will probably be some, some type of documentary later uh, in the process, but we can't predict at this stage. Uh, we're focusing on caring for this, for this multimedia collection right now. So we have the cooperation of the Hellenic American Project uh, and I want to do a shout out to Professor Nick Alexiou, who's, who's really been championing that and doing a great job there. And Queens College is in the center of the largest Greek community in America. So one of the largest Greek communities in the world. Um, and it has a very good Hellenic uh, studies program and a very good Jewish studies program. So we have that, that, that helping us. And then a shout out to the special collections at Queens College, which is actually doing all the technical work to conserve and to catalog the collection. And uh, they are actually, be, they will be the ones that will be hosting the online exhibition uh, this, this year. Uh, so, so Annie Tomino, who's the head of special collections there has been a great help. Uh, we also have great scholarly advice from some leading scholars in the field of Greek uh, Jewish history like Steve Bowman and Sephardi history like Jane Gerber um, and uh, thanks to everyone who's been, been contributing. So, you know, we think the, the ingredients are in this project to, to really make it cook, if we go back to the, to the cooking analogy. <laughs> By the way, I actually have the recipe for uh, uh, either casates or, 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 or calzoni, I'm not sure uh, the, the term or the pronunciation, pronunciation which are these, these wonderful uh, cheese pastries from, from Yanina and, uh, I want to emphasize that one of the differences is up in, in Yanina, they use rolled dough uh, as much as the, the, the phyllo dough that you find down in, 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 the, in the Peloponnese. Uh, so there are unique uh, culinary delights. And if you go to the museum at Kihila Kadoshi Yanina any Sunday morning, although with COVID, I don't know what the schedule is, whether when and where they'll be open, uh, they often have lunches afterward and you can actually sample uh, some of the local uh, members of the community cook some of these marvelous dishes and you can eat some of the traditional uh, Greek Romagnot uh, cuisine after having an experience in the sanctuary, in the synagogue, 
and also seeing the wonderful exhibition that Marcia Economopoulos has, has prepared in the, uh, in the upper uh, gallery, the women's uh, uh, gallery um, upstairs. So it's, it's, worth, it's worth a Sunday morning visit. Um, Marcia Economopoulos organizes tours to Greece. Yes. Visit um, Jewish sites all over Greece. Just a little plug for her. Um, and that will, I, I'm sure, start up again next year. Well, after hearing uh, Renee's uh, description of the cookbook and Sam talking about the cheese pastries, uh, <laughs> I think that that's probably, and we're talking here a couple hours before lunch, but it, yes, it, it, I'm it, ready. Is, it, is, <laughs> it is food for thought. Well, Sam, uh, Renee, uh, thank you very much for shedding light on such an important community in the diaspora through Vincent Giordano's photographs and your own research and the work that you're doing. We're grateful for what you're doing. Really appreciate both of you being here today. Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much. Well, huge thanks to Dr. Sam Gruber and Renee Pappas for joining me today. And thank you for checking out this conversation with B'nai Brith. If you like what you've heard, make sure you never miss a program by subscribing to the B'nai Brith YouTube channel and liking us on Facebook. And be sure to visit our website, b'naibrith.org, to learn about our important work. See you again soon. Take care, everyone.